We are reading through the great adventure and uh, pray that you have joined us reading from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible for three years, a very slow pace so that anybody can join along. Most people have never read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and so this is our desire to lead in a very uh, slow, uh, consistent way through these passages of Scripture. And this week's reading was Ezekiel chapter 29 through chapter 35. And we're in the prophets, and the prophets can be difficult because their primary message is usually correction and judgment for a people that have went astray, worshiping idols, and turned their back on God. So it's kind of a heavy message about uh, probably 80% judgment and 20% encouragement and hope. And so uh, as you wade your way through that, but it's good for our souls to let the Word of God search our hearts. And from our reading, we like to take a section of that and share with you on the, the weekend services. This week, we've chosen chapter 33 of Ezekiel. If you have a Bible, you want to open to Ezekiel chapter 33 for our message, The Watchman. And what it means to be a watchman from God's perspective. Ezekiel is the watchman in this story, and yet we learn some practical applications for our own life. Let's read the first seven verses as we begin here in Ezekiel chapter 33. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, speak to the children of my people or your people and say to them, when I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head." He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man... I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. This picture that was very common to them in the Old Testament for walled cities, they would take a watchman, employ him, hire him, and he was to be on top of that wall looking the direction of that wall, and they would have watchmen around the perimeter of a city all looking in their specific direction. They are looking at a long distance. No doubt they tried to get somebody with 20-20 vision, not nearsighted like me, that things have to come up and slap me in the face before I can really see what's going on. But with good vision, they would see an invading army that was coming to threaten the city. And at that time, they were to blow the trumpet so all the people could get prepared that the enemy was coming, there was an attack. And so it was the early warning system of Old Testament times, and that's what Ezekiel was. The Lord said, you're going to be my watchman. And this is God's method throughout the scriptures, is that he picks a man or a woman to be his servant, to bring a message to a small group of people, to a large group of people, and all the way through scripture, this is God's methodology to reach a world, to warn them about things, to share the love and hope that is in Christ Jesus. And as we look at this passage of scripture, He says specifically that the watchman's job was to blow the trumpet, but if he didn't warn the people, then when disaster happened, he was responsible. But if he saw the watchman, if he saw and he blew the trumpet to warn the people and the people didn't take warning, well, that was all on them. You see, every time you have a conversation with someone about the Lord, or we have a time like today where I'm sharing God's truth with you, this is really a 50-50 proposition, that it's my job to study and prepare God's Word and to deliver to God's people, but what you do with it, it's your job to stay awake, understand the message, and apply it to your life. That's your job, okay? Make sure you don't go to sleep or nudge your buddy that's there wanting to go to sleep and listen to the message because ultimately... In our culture, when it comes to church, people put an unreasonable amount of pressure on the the church ministry, upon worship, upon the message, and basically they come in like this. Hey, it's 90% the minister and the worship team's job to impress me, to move me in some way, and I only have about 10% responsibility. If they don't do their job, then so what? But it's not that way. Even if I share with someone in a one-on-one way and I share the hope that's in Jesus with them, You see, I can share it. That's my responsibility. 
But what they do with that message, that's their responsibility. And the thing is about Ezekiel's ministry is he, he really wants to squarely have everybody own their own responsibility in the equation of a relationship with God. You see, it's not all God. It's not other people's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's you and the Lord and how you respond to his message. So each of us has a responsibility to be a, a witness. Now, in a radical way, Ezekiel was called to be a watchman, and if he didn't do his job, the blood was going to be upon him. And if he did his job, then it was people's responsibility what they did with that warning. You see, in the same way as Christians, we look a long ways from the city wall, so to speak, and is there danger coming? All of us realize that we have a short time on planet Earth. We are headed towards eternity at breakneck speed, and God wants to have a relationship with us here and now. But this is our opportunity here and now on planet Earth to develop this relationship with God, to walk in fellowship with God, but eternity is coming. Heaven and hell are both coming. And in a lesser way, even though Paul the Apostle did use this picture himself of himself as a watchman, in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, Paul says to the Ephesian elders, therefore I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. You see, Paul had come to Ephesus. He had shared God's word, the whole counsel of God with them for three years. And so he told the Ephesian elders, I am guiltless of the blood of all men and women that heard my message. I faithfully declared as a watchman the word of the Lord. Now, it might be a little ominous, and I've heard this message preached in such a way, it's almost a heavy message of condemnation. This specific illustration or application for us is that we're all just to be a witness. We're all to be a witness for Jesus Christ. Jesus told us he would give us the power to do that in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses. And he told them in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But for you and I, this is our Jerusalem. This is our hometown. So he wants to empower us to be a witness for what he's done in our life. It tells us in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. This is encouragement for all Christians just to let your speech be salty, meaning that you're sharing the things of the Lord with the people that God's put in your life and that you love and care about. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. He says, be ready to share the hope that you have in Jesus. Are you ready to share? When somebody asks you, hey, I've noticed that you're different. I've noticed that there's something up with you. Uh, what's up? Do you have a, uh, a practice tool in your tool belt spiritually called your testimony? Have you practiced how God has saved you and what he's done in your life that in a minute you can share with someone the hope that's in Jesus? Every Christian should develop this. Uh, I'll know if, if I'm with my wife and I hear my wife begin to share that she's going for her testimony and she's going to share the hope that she has in Jesus. She knows from the, my, my phraseology, she can share my testimony, I can share her testimony. But it goes something like this. I'm working with someone, they say, hey, what's up with you, Rick? What's your story? And I go, well, you know, I was living in sin. I was, uh, you know, head deep in drugs and alcohol and violence. I was in trouble with the law. And, and then, you know, one day the Lord just ministered to my heart. And I remember, remembered from when I was a kid that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And that if I would repent and I would turn from my sins and trust him as my savior, he would forgive me of my sins and I would have eternal life, a quality of life here and now and forevermore. And you see, that took me less, less than 60 seconds to share that with you. My daughter came to me when she was about 18. She was working at this uh, place, and maybe she was 19. And she was working, uh, and she was wanting to share her faith, but she wasn't sure how to do it. And she said, Dad, I don't have a testimony. I said, you have the most awesome testimony. I wish I had your testimony. I wish I didn't have my testimony. But see, people, they hear my testimony, and they think that's what a testimony is, this dark, ugly picture. No, it's not. It's what Jesus has done in your personal life. I said, Jesse, I can share with you your testimony in less than a minute. And, and she said, you can? I said, yeah, I can share your testimony. You want to hear it? She goes, I'd love to hear my testimony. <laughs> I said, 
Jesse, you're sharing with somebody, they ask you a question, you say, well, I grew up in the church, and my dad was a pastor, but at the age of nine, I realized even though I was growing up in a pastor's home, and I went to church every Sunday, and I actually read my Bible and prayed, that I could never remember asking Jesus into my life. So one day, I walked into my dad's uh, study, where he was studying, and I said, Dad, I want to receive Christ. I want him to forgive me of my sins. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. And so we prayed together, and I received Christ. And ever since then, I realized that I had this relationship with God, and he's filled me with love and joy and peace, and he is my everything. And I shared her testimony in 60 seconds, because that was her testimony. And she's she's been using that testimony really effectively ever since, (laughs) because that's what happened in her life. You see, it's simply putting into words what's happened in your life, right? And every one of you are unique to how God met you and what he did in your life. And so each of us, God has put people in your life for you to love them and to care for them, but to have salty speech, to be the light of the world, to be an example to them that they are curious about you, and when they ask the question, you share the simple good news message. Now, in a radical way, Ezekiel was a watchman to a whole nation. He was a prophet. And one of the things that was going to take place in his life was he's going to minister to all kinds of people, right? As, as you are also going to minister to all kinds of people. And now he gives us this illustration in verse 13 through 16, which are polar opposites. A self-righteous person that trusts in his own righteousness all the way to a wicked person that's living a very sinful life. And what he gets by choosing two extreme examples is that you get everybody in between. Everybody in this room, you're either uh, kind of the goody two-shoe sinner or you're the far me type of sinner. You're, you're the dark, dark horse over here. But everybody's somewhere in that spectrum. And the thing is, is the hope that we have in Jesus. Check it out. This is what the watchman is tell, to tell the self-righteous person. It says in verse 13, when I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. In this Old Testament sense, he said, here you are, you're, you're a watchman, and you're, you're to minister to a person. And this happens to you and I. You start ministering to somebody, and they trust in their own righteousness. Have you ever tried to share God's love with somebody that thinks they're too good for Jesus? They, they're going to go to heaven all on their own. That Heaven was designed for them, good people, right? And they trust in their own righteousness. And this is such a fallacy. As a watchman or a Christian, I need to share with them that your own righteousness, your own goodness will not get you to heaven. And they're so offended, like, what do you mean? You know, I'm a good person. I love my neighbor as myself, and I take good care of my family. I do. Well, you do all of that, but are you perfect? Well, no, nobody's perfect. Right. I'm not perfect. You're not. None of us are perfect, right? And they have a hard time with that. It's a tough pill to swallow. So I have to share with them, your righteousness is like filthy rags, it says in the book of Isaiah. This is what Paul the Apostle, the most self-righteous do-gooder you ever met in your whole life, this is what Paul says about his own righteousness and the righteousness of Jesus in Philippians 3, 9. And be found in him, speaking of Jesus, being found in Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul the Apostle said, I gave up my own self-righteousness so that I could have the righteousness by faith that Jesus gives to those who believe, a righteous standing before God. Now, Paul the Apostle in that Philippians passage goes on to say that my all, everything that I had to my credit was basically rubbish, garbage, and dung. He, it's, it's poop. That's what it is. Okay, just so that you know. We're trying to you know, keep it real. So he says, I count all of that as a pile of garbage, as a pile of rubbish, as a pile of poop. And it's like a self-righteous person is standing on their garbage pile or up on their poop pile like, look at me. I got a kingdom of garbage. Aren't I great? I got a kingdom of poop under my feet. Are you impressed? Right? Have you ever driven by a feed lot and you see that big snack of manure and one cow up there as if, look at my kingdom. I got a kingdom of poop. It's green and it stinks. I am the most righteous cow in this entire you know, lot. And that's what you're doing. In your own righteousness, if you think that you're too good, because don't we agree? If 
we could get to heaven by simply being good, Jesus would not have had to come. God would have just sent us all a massive text that said, hey, just be good. You're good to go. Right? Just be good. No. Why did Jesus have to come and die on a brutal cross? Because you cannot be good enough to experience God's heaven. Do you know that the standard, the requirement to go to God's heaven is perfection? And I don't know about you, but I'm well aware that I am not perfect. So the fact is, is that we have to take on the perfect righteousness of Christ by faith in him. And so I give up my own righteousness. I I didn't have any. You see, people like me, like sinners, we didn't have a problem. When somebody said, man, Rick, you're living in sin, I go, yeah, you bet, I am. But when you talk to a good person, you say, you're a sinner, I am not. They got it all together or something. Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they thought they had it all together and they were God's gift to serve him. He said, you know what? You know, you guys are not entering into the kingdom of heaven, but prostitutes and tax collectors are. The worst of society is entering in. Why? Because they see their need. You must see your need. You must see, you must see your need. So, as we see this watchman, he is to declare the warning to the self-righteous person. You see that watchman that is watching on the wall? Just like a, a lifeguard would be looking for danger for somebody that would be drowning to, to help them. Like a forest ranger would keep his eye on the horizon for smoke. You know, there is a danger to the self-righteous person. There's also a danger to the sinner in verse 14 through 16. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked rest- restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. See, the understanding for the wicked person is, hey, man, you got to turn. I know you're living in sin. you got to turn from your lifestyle of sin. you got to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and then none of your sins are going to be remembered anymore. You and I have this incredible vantage point of living today after the message of the cross. They did not have that benefit. They had to offer blood sacrifices through animals. But they could repent. They could have this relationship with God. And ultimately, that's what God wants. God wants a relationship with you that is not a simple prayer to receive Christ like some magic wand and then go back and live however you want. No, that prayer to open your heart to Christ is just the beginning point of having a lifelong relationship with him. So you and I are to be those witnesses that share with and have the answers to the self-righteous person or their very bad person. I've had people tell me, just like the self-righteous person when I'm sharing with them, one day I was sharing with this very smug, self-righteous individual, and I was sharing my testimony. And I think I, I shared a little too much of my testimony. I've learned over the years I should only share so much of my testimony because it was a little scary for them. And they got this disgusted look on their face. They were just so offended by who I was before I came to Christ. And they looked at me and go, well, you need a Jesus. I said, yeah. I just smile because I, I, I admit that. Yeah, I do. And I stepped forward and I said, and so do you. But they didn't believe that they did. So when we're in that place of of ministering to them or to the wicked person, I've had the opposite effect. Those I share the hope of Jesus. Hey, God will forgive you. God can't forgive me. You don't know what I've done. I've done too much. If I came to church, the roof would collapse. I tell them, dude, if that was true, this would be a crater out here. Because the people that come to our church are just... You know, and we, we because we, we have an area that is very religious in nature, we have these very religious people that they weren't saved and they get saved, and then we have these meth addicts that get saved. It's like the polar opposite ends of things. We have, we have cops that get saved and they come, and then they see this dude they threw in jail last month, and he's here too, right? So we have this incredible mix of the grace of God that people have put their faith in Jesus. And that's what Jesus does is he puts us together in this incredible thing called the Christian life. For us who are far away, listen to what Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says. It says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, You see, at one time you were alienated. You were far from God. I was so far from God, but when I believed in Jesus, he brought us close. 
he brought you close to reconcile us. It means to bring friendly, harmonious relationship where there was open hostility. And now I have this relationship with God. And through faith in Jesus, he gives me his righteous standing. He gives you his righteous standing by faith in him. He says to present us holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. That's how God looks at you as a forgiven person. You are holy. You are blameless. You are above reproach in his sight because of your faith in his son, Jesus. Well, when you share something like that, people are troubled. People are troubled in both ways, and this is what they say. God's not fair. You ever had somebody share that with you? Well, if I was a God of love, how could a God of love send somebody to hell or this or that? It says in verse 17, yet the children of your people say the way of the Lord is not fair, but it is their way which is not fair. You see, the righteous person, when you share with them, hey, I know you're trusting in your own righteousness, but Jesus' righteousness is the only thing that will forgive you. You need to turn to him and trust him. They go, well, that's not fair. If God doesn't accept nice people like me, I've had people tell me, I I mean, I'm going to heaven. I said, well, do you believe in Jesus? No, I don't need Jesus. I'm just a good person. I said, no, you're not going to make it. Do you know that, I've shared with you, do you know that hell's going to be filled with good people? (gasps) Well, that's not fair. I feel like I'm talking to a third grader. That's not fair. No, don't you get it? God has a plan. He has a plan to remedy our condition. And if you don't like his plan and you call his plan not fair and you reject his plan, that's all on you, man. That's all on you. He's got a plan. And to say that God in his love and his grace has given us a plan and you don't like the plan and then to charge God with it not being fair, that's ridiculous. It makes no logical sense. But then the person that is very wicked, when they get saved, when people like me get saved, people go, that's not fair. You can't be that bad and do all that stuff and just ask God to forgive you and be forgiven. That's not fair. What is it with you people? It's a no-win situation, right? The righteous person doesn't think it's fair that he doesn't get to go to heaven without Jesus. And then they look at wicked people that get saved by him. That's that's not fair. You shouldn't even be a pastor. (laughs) Say, I agree. I shouldn't be. But it's called grace. That's why it's called grace. Isn't it strange, though? And then people, I'll start sharing the hope with them, and all of a sudden, people that don't want to talk about their own spiritual condition, they deflect the question, and they deflect the question in the far beyond into the jungles of South America. And you're sharing the hope in Jesus, and they go, instead of thinking about them, they go, well, what about the native that's never heard about the gospel? I'm like, there are so many people deeply concerned for these people. They're always talking about it. What about the people that have never heard about Jesus? What about that? How's God going to judge them? Well, let me tell you how God's going to judge them. He tells us in Romans chapter 1 that people are without excuse because of creation without. And then he says in Romans chapter 2 that men and women are also without excuse because of the conscience within in them. Check it out. It says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and godhood, so that they are with, would you say it with me, without excuse. When you look at creation, you go, whoa, there's a supernatural being that put all this together. Unless you've been to university and believed Darwin's theory, then you're kind of duped. But for the majority of people, you just look around and, man, there's a God. Look at the beauty of creation. And God says, everybody that's never heard the gospel, you've never heard John 3, 16, you've never heard a Bible verse in your entire life, you're living, growing up in this tribe, in this strange language, and the gospel's never reached you in the dark forest of the Amazon, and you know what? God says, okay, that's the knowledge you have. What is the knowledge you have? Creation around you. And creation around you, every primitive people, every tribal people, all have gods that they serve because they know what? There is a God. Now, they're usually twisted and mixed up, and they're uh, kind of perverted deities, but there is a God. Secondly, God says that he will judge us that have never heard the gospel with our conscience. It says in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. All mankind, all men and women, if they've never heard about Jesus, they have a conscience within. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it awakened their conscience. Every single one of us in this room know good and evil. 
From the time you begin to grow up, you begin, your conscious is aware, hey, that's wrong. Don't do that. And maybe nobody's ever told you, don't do that. This is right. This is what we should do. Every one of us in this room, now our conscience is not a perfect guide, but it does either accuse us, hey, you just did something wrong, or excuse us, hey, that was the right thing to do. Every human being has it. So we have the creation without, and we have the conscience within, because God holds people accountable to what they know. What you know is what God holds you accountable, and that's the measure in which he uses to judge people. Now, the thing is, is you this morning are not in the dark forests of the Amazon. You have a whole boatload of knowledge. Jesus loves you, died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead, and if you believe in him, he'll forgive you of your sins, you'll have everlasting life, and you'll have a relationship with him that he brings abundant life here and now, and if you choose to reject that message, you're going to hell. Therefore, do any of you not know this message today? The person in the back right now is sleeping. Wake him up so we can share it with him again. See, the reality is you're accountable to what you know. Now, some people have literally told me at this point, like, well, I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> and they just, like, they're out, they're get out of Dodge, right? I, I don't want to have more information to be accountable. Man, you, you already have so much to be accountable. Just being in church, hearing the gospel. Even as a little young heathen, I had the accountability of knowing Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. When I was a little kid, I didn't want to serve him. I didn't want to follow him. And I went and lived in sin, but I had that accountability. I knew. I had grandparents that loved me and shared with me and took me to church when I was a little kid. And so I knew. Now, not only that, but have you ever wondered, and since that's the case, is there degrees in hell for punishment? Have you ever wondered about that? There's a parable that Jesus mentions in Luke chapter 12, verse 47 and 48, that seems to uh, insinuate this or imply this. It says, that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes, but he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with you. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Meaning that if you knew God's will and you choose not to do it, then you're going to experience a greater judgment. And if you didn't know God's will, then you're going to experience a lesser judgment. So there may be something to that whole statement of the hottest place in hell, that there is a degree, depending on your knowledge and what you reject in your knowledge or how much you didn't know. So as we move on, this is the thought that now comes into that relationship. Okay, let's say that you're not saying God's not fair. You're the rich, righteous person that now has put your trust in Jesus. You're the wicked person that's now put your trust in Jesus. There are those who, they think that they're, they're religious enough to have the blessing of God, but they're actually still living in sin. They won't turn. They won't repent. They, their faith and their lifestyle don't line up. As it says in 23 through 26, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, they who inhabit those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land. But we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say to them, once again, the watchman's job to warn them, thus says the Lord God, you eat meat with blood. You lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You commit abominations. You defile one another's wives. Should you then possess the land? You see, there was this remnant that was there after the Babylonians hauled everybody off into captivity. There's this handful of people that is um, plural. I mean, there's a number of them, though there's still few. They said, you know what? God gave Abraham this land, and he's one guy. And we're many, and so we're going to possess this land. And the Lord ministers to them through the watchman, Ezekiel, to warn them. They said, no, 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 no. You got it wrong. You're comparing yourself with Abraham. Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees in obedience to faith, and he believed God, and God accounted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was not a perfect man, but Abraham pursued faith and obedience in God. But these people were saying they were Abraham's descendants, but they were living in blatant sin, but they wanted the blessing of God. You will meet people on a consistent basis that they want to live in their corrupt, perverse lifestyle, but they want the blessing of God on their life. And the watchman had to tell them those two things are inconsistent. God's grace is not a license to live in sin. 
God's grace should transform us that we want to move away from sin. And there are people that are living in sin. Every weekend, people come to church here that are living in total blatant sin, but they would say, I believe in Jesus. I've known the Lord for 10 years. They're shacked up with their girlfriend. They're smoking dope on the weekends. They're stealing from the boss. They're disrespectful to their parents. There's, there, there's nothing with the name Christian that is consistent with their lifestyle whatsoever. But they want the blessing of God in their life. Don't you realize that this relationship with God that he wants with you is to permeate and invade every area of your life? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. There's an obedience that comes with a faith-filled life that God's grace produces in believers that begins to be consistent. That doesn't mean we're perfect. No Christian's perfect. But it means it's a direction of pursuit that you are pursuing the things of God with a heart of love and obedience. And when God reveals sin to you in your life, you repent, you turn from it, you don't want it in your life. Therefore, God can do everything that he wants to do in your life. I call it being under the spout where the blessings flow out. It's not that if you're living in blatant sin and you claim the name of Christ as your Lord and Savior, and God's not doing what you would love it to see him do in your life, it's because you have removed yourself into a place that God cannot do all that he wants to do in your life. But if you would turn to him and yield to him by faith and obedience, God can do all that he wants to do in your life. But it's really, really inconsistent to say, I know Jesus, and I'm living in blatant sin, and I want his blessing. You know, the, I've talked to the most ungodly people in the world, and yet they still say they want to go to God's heaven. Say, when are you going to die? What are you going to do? Well, I'd like to go to heaven. The alternative is not very good. I say, yeah, what do they want? They want the blessing of God with no relationship with God. They don't want to have a relationship with Jesus. They don't want to read his word and have him change their life. They don't want to pray and have his spirit change their life. They don't want to be a part of God's church and God's people and all those things. But they want God's blessing. Now, is there something inconsistent about that? There's something radically inconsistent. And and the watchman needs to tell people that. He needs to say, you know what? You want the blessing of God, but you don't want to yield to God's heart. You you don't want to obey. You You don't want to follow him. Like Jesus said, if you hear my words... And you'll be him. You'll be like a wise man that built his house on the rock. And when the storm of life came against it, you'll stand, man, because the blessing of God and the work of God in your life. Well, we close here today with this thought of the watchman. And the Lord wants to tell him what the people are saying about him. If the Lord is to say, Rick, you want to hear what the people in the church are saying? Yeah, let's just pass on that. Let's, let's just don't really need to know. Let's just, I know this, this thing with you is really sweet. But this is what the Lord tells Ezekiel. Verse 30 through 33, as for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses, and they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word of the Lord is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when they, uh, this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. He says, you know what Ezekiel people are saying about you? And maybe even this week in, in any congregation about their church and their pastor and stuff, they're talking about things and, and, and they go, wow, we, you know, we loved the church service last week. It was awesome. And did you hear that message? And you're talking about somebody at work. You're talking with somebody on the phone about it. And the Lord says, yeah, they, they're talking about you, Ezekiel, but this is what they think. They think you're like a person that sings, a, you have a wonderful voice and you play an instrument. They're saying of you, Ezekiel, it's like listening to Buster all week long. You know what I mean? Buster's got, he plays an instrument well, he's got a wonderful voice, and that's what the sermon's like. But they hear it, and they enjoy it, and then they leave, and they don't do it. Once again, a 50-50 proposition. The servant of the Lord is to deliver the message of God. The people of the Lord are to stay awake, understand the message, and apply it to their life. It's a very common thing, you guys. For people to come to church, and because we come to church and we hear the message of the Lord, we think it's the same as doing and applying the message of the Lord. When you come to church and you hear the word of the Lord, or you're reading your Bible personally and you, hear, you read the word of the Lord, and God speaks to you about changing some issue in your life, do you just blow that off or do you say, Lord, I, I really, please forgive me, I, this is true in my life and I need to turn away from this. Please help me, Lord. 
and your life begins to be one that is just open to the searchlight of God's word, and you want to respond, you want to be obedient to what God reveals to your heart. You see, James said the same thing to a congregation. He says in James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, he said, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James said the same thing. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Ezekiel, people are listening to you, but they're not doing what you're saying. But that's not on Ezekiel. Once again, this is a backhanded gift of freedom for Ezekiel. If I share here this morning with you, and I faithfully share God's word with you, and I walk away from this, it is not my burden or my my responsibility to change anyone in this room. It's your responsibility to have a relationship with God. And the Lord had to teach me this in a radical way when I was a young pastor. I was so frustrated. I, I, actually, I resigned. How do you resign when God's your boss? Well, I just wrote a letter. I figured, he, you know, free postage. He, he can read it. And so I just wrote it out, and I, I was very frustrated. I was very discouraged. And in an attitude of prayer, I just thought, I just got to get this out of me. I got to process it. So I wrote it out, basically, in my letter of resignation. And, the, and not even knowing what was, what was bothering me so much in my heart, but I realized As I was sharing God's word, I didn't see people really wanting to be doers of the word, but just hearers. And the Lord just really encouraged my heart. He said, I've never asked you to to change the people. I've asked you just to be my voice and to speak for me, and it really set me free. I learned that in counseling. People will come in, and they'll say, hey, what's the Bible say about A, B, and C? And I'll say, this is what the Bible says about A, B, and C. And they leave that office, and now they know what the Bible says, but they don't plan on doing it. And that used to frustrate me. I'd do marriage counseling and say, this is what the Bible says this is how marriage works for the husband and how, for the wife. But then they'd leave and not do it and end up in divorce in eight months. And I used to take that on myself like, I must not have married them right. I must not have counseled them right. I must not have preached right. Well, that's true. Because the bottom line is you can share with other people. And whether they respond or not, that's on them. That's on them. You can share the hope you have in Jesus. And if they choose to outright, uh, reject that outright, that's on them. You see, it's very freeing. I've never converted anybody in my whole life. I've shared the gospel and the Holy Spirit has done things and people have gotten converted, but it's not my job to convince people. My job is to share the truth and let the Holy Spirit do with it what he wants to do. And then I can step back and have real freedom because I did my job. I did my job. I I was the messenger. I was the watchman in that situation. But he says, you know what? People that hear the word And then they leave. It's like looking in the mirror. Now, I I presume, because some of you look very nice today. We're not talking about everybody, but some of you look very nice today. (laughs) And I would just venture a real, you know, outlandish thought that most of you got up this morning like I did and looked in the mirror. And the older you get, the scarier it gets, isn't it? I mean, it takes a half an hour for the wrinkles to fall out of your face when you get, you know, hit 50. It's like, come on, collagen, where are you at? You're down there somewhere. But you know what I mean? You, you look in the mirror and, and you need to comb your hair. You need to take a shower. Us guys, we need to shave. We need to you know, brush our teeth, do all of that stuff. But it would be like in a relationship with God, it's like you look in the mirror and you are frightening. Right? You're just like scary. And then you walk away and go, I'm fine. And can you imagine? I mean, just think about it. Can you imagine all of us showing up here this morning in our jammies looking just like we got out of bed this morning? It would be... It would be frightening, <laughs> right? Ladies, you know, only half their makeup still on, the other half still on the pillow. It, it just, because you would forget, but we look in the mirror and the mirror helps us out, but the mirror can do it its job. What's it do? It says, this is what you need, right? This is what you need. Rick, you should comb your hair. You should brush your teeth. You should sh- shave your face. Then it's my responsibility to do that. And in God's grace, he loves us so much. He said, this is what I've done for you in my grace. I've given my son so that you can be cleansed from your sin and have abundant life here and now in eternity with me and have a relationship with me more than anything, a loving, faithful, obedient relationship with me by my grace. And if you do that, 
life just begins to take on a whole new ramification. If you begin to be a doer of the word, when I read something in God's word that challenges my heart that I need to repent of, that I need to change, that I need to seek God's help in transforming that part of my life, then I just pursue that. I just pursue that. And what happens is incrementally, it's called sanctification. You begin to grow more and more to where you begin to be transformed and look a lot more like Jesus. And so that's God's plan in this dynamic thing called a relationship with God. But he uses people like he does Ezekiel as a watchman. But for us, we're just to be people that share the hope that we have in Jesus with this world. And what they do with it, that's between them and the Lord. But at least we've had the opportunity to share in his love that message. It's a great time, as we focus so much upon the Lord's, Jesus' work in our life, to end this first weekend of the month with communion. And so we're going to pray, and as we pray, our worship team is going to come out, our servants team is going to come down, and, and if you need the gluten-free wafers for communion, please raise your hand. The servants team will get that for you. And let's just pray that the Lord gets a hold of our heart, that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Let's pray. Lord, we just have open hearts, and we really want you to do your work in our lives. And we ask that you would forgive us, Lord, for uh, just playing a game and hearing the word but not responding to it. So please forgive us, Lord. And I pray that you would just lead us in a way, and by your Holy Spirit, into a fruitful, effective life and relationship with you. And prepare our hearts now as we remember you and your body that was given for us and your blood that was shed for us in communion, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.